Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, second part there for the 26th of April 2024. As is the case at the moment, this video will be packed with a lot of info uh, and so it might be a little bit longer than my normal military aid videos. I've had to split off the geopolitics from it because this is a time where people are giving big military air pack aid packages like the Americans and uh, a time when the Ukrainians are asking for so much kit that there are so many coalitions working to get them this kit of differing varieties so so that there's just an awful lot of information every single day to share with you i mean it's it's at least double what it previously was on my normal daily basis so okay we're going to start with first of all this massive us aid package that has been touted over the last 24 hours so it's not the billion dollar one that you're talking that we talked about with regard to presidential drawdown authority go and check my video yesterday explaining how the usa package works this is another one for six billion dollars but the difference here is this is usai so this is where the us contract uh put orders out contracts out for equipment to be made that is then manufactured and they get that to Ukraine. So that could take anywhere between months and years, literally years. So this $6 billion package is a kind of sorting out the long term. Some people have been saying this ring fences aid to Ukraine past November. And that's why they've got they're, they're getting this out of the way now, early doors. So you put the orders in. I mean, Ukraine need it anyway, so you could argue it needs to be done now. But but there is this element that if, if they can get the orders in, that equipment will be delivered to Ukraine past November and past the time where you could have a political landscape that does not favour Ukraine. And I think that's something significant to bear in mind. Okay, according to Politico, US is preparing to announce a $6 billion weapons contract for Ukraine. The package could be finalised and announced as soon as today. It would include Patriot Air Defence Systems, Asterix, we'll come back to that in a second, artillery and munition, drones, counter-drone weapons and air-to-air -air missiles to be fitted on fighter planes. The equipment likely won't arrive in Ukraine for several years as the money is being allocated under the USAI, United, sorry, Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which issues contracts to American defense firms to build new equipment for Ukraine as opposed to drawing from current US stocks. Okay, this got everyone all a flutter yesterday, last night, as people are like, oh, this is amazing, they need Patriots. How quickly can they expedite Patriot systems through the manufacturing process and Raytheon and now they're getting other co companies to maybe manufacture components and parts and or maybe whole bits of the system uh, maybe in spain maybe norway's being touted etc etc okay there's now been a bit of a change today colby badwa says it seems that politico edited this report after publication changing patriot systems to patriot munitions bloomberg is now reporting the same thing the six billion dollar usai package will include patriot missiles that is like, yeah. Ukraine desperately need those Patriot systems. Now, you might get Patriot systems given by the US as part of the Presidential Drawdown Authority and then replaced through the replenishment funding. And that is obviously another way of getting those systems. And actually a quicker way of getting those systems than putting it on order. So that is still open, of course. If accurate, this will be a massive failure by the Biden administration. Ukraine is in desperate need of additional patriots so that they can cover more territory. The best possible thing they could do is draw down UCOM's Patriot Battalion to Ukraine. But if they aren't willing to do that, ordering new batteries is the least they can do. So I, I would, I know Colby, he's not a fan of, uh, but he's quite a conservative commentator from Canada. So not a fan of the Biden administration. I would just hold on a second because the the Biden administration still might do something patriot -y like that. But if they don't do that and they don't put an order in, then I would agree with um, with Badwa here. The best time to do that was two years ago. Absolutely. The second best time is now. Every additional day of delay costs lives. I suppose you could argue they could take from drawdown and put orders in because there, there is that much need for patriots okay so there is that now we're going to go to patriots with uh, the rest of europe so 
We, the first thing to note is that Greece has now formally refused to hand over Patriots and S300 systems to Ukraine. I was pretty sure they were handing over S300s. It might be that they're keeping some of them because remember they, they've got a load of old Soviet kit. There was this idea that they were going to give that over in, in part the deal with the F-35s again from the US. Okay. Greece has supported Ukraine in various ways, including defence materials, says their Prime Minister Mitsotakis. Now remember, Mitsotakis recently visited Odessa and there was a missile that landed very close to him in Odessa and he has subsequently claimed that that was an attack by Russia on him. So there's some people kicking off about this and we'll come to that in a second. But uh, yeah, Greece... Uh, he, he said, but we have said from the very beginning that we cannot provide weapon systems that are crucial for our, our deterrence capability. Now, this is a country who is always on tenterhooks. They are one of the ones that pay over 2% uh, of GDP and have done since 2014, I believe, uh, on defence and qualify for NATO consistently. And that's because they are always worried about an uh, a conflict erupting with Turkey, uh, particularly over Cyprus, which is kind of split in half between the two nations. Uh, World at War here says Greece has 36 Patriot launchers, so they have four or five systems. Greece is afraid of getting into conflict with Turkey, and for that reason, they do not want to send any Patriot system to Ukraine. So that's their claim there. Uh, after Poland and very likely the Netherlands, Greece also said no to the German appeal to supply Patriot batteries to Ukraine via the German initiative. So yesterday we had Boris Pistorius getting pretty annoyed, the defence minister for Germany, because they're doing everything they can to support Ukraine. They're going above and beyond compared to other nations. They said, right, we will pro pro provide one more Patriot. They've already provided two, remember. And they said, right, where are the rest of Europe? Come on, guys. And then subsequently, other European nations have gone, yeah, no. So I can understand the Germans being annoyed at that. Prime Minister Mitsotakis has ruled out delivery of Patriot and S-300s because of the critical determinant capability for Greece. This means that the circle of countries that could at least in theory provide Patriot batteries to Ukraine is getting smaller and smaller. The US is and remains the most likely followed by Sweden. So far, at least publicly, with 150 million euros in funding, only the Netherlands has made a firm commitment to the German initiative, which aims to strengthen Ukraine's air defence in the short term. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's a real shame. And more bad news to come. So Spain has agreed to supply Patriot missiles they were being pressured it was spain and greece that the one main ones being pressured to give patriot systems spain has said no but we can supply patriot missiles to ukraine in the face of pressure from nato and the eu so that the european countries that have american-made systems deliver it to kiev with the aim of strengthening its air defense ukraine battle map says eu and nato funding for spain should be wiped other countries have given significant portions of their military gdp to defend europe to, in ukraine Sp spain since the start of the war has allocated 325 million dollars to ukraine one of the lowest they also don't pay anywhere near two percent for nato bear in mind that they will be paying for ukraine support through the eu funding and that's always important they are the fourth biggest economy in the eu However, the general point is true. And I think this is going to be largely to do with Spain being on the very western edge of Europe and not feeling the heat, not having that historical connection between uh, any kind of Russian empirical desires. They're not the Baltics or the Nordics or Poland or indeed Ukraine, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, etc. So Spain are very much a different cultural historical kettle of fish However, this is free riding. And uh, when someone says, where is it here? Uh, well, Ukraine battle map again. This country does not deserve to be in NATO or get any more EU aid. Spain is ranked third worst of the 30 in the defence expenditure as a share of GDP percentage. In NATO's most recent statistic from 2023, they are far below the 2% required, only spending 1.24% in 2023. So you've got Spain, Belgium and Luxembourg uh, as well as Canada, interestingly, Slovenia, and indeed Italy. All of these nations are below 1.5, Portugal as well. These nations really need to pick up, um, really need to pick up full stop. Spain 
therefore not only not doing enough in terms of spending on their own defence as a part of NATO criteria, but also not helping Ukraine as much as they could. And I think this is this is really unfortunate for Spain. So no report says Spain will supply a small batch of Patriot missiles to Ukraine, but refuse to deliver a battery, Patriot battery. Furthermore, Spain is preparing a new arms package. So they are preparing something which will be sent before the 30th of June. It includes 10 of the 19 Leopard 2A4s that are being refurbished at the moment and will be added to the 10 delivered last year. So Spain has delivered some main battle tanks, some pretty decent main battle tanks, but yeah, more to be done there. Right, now we're going to go back to <clears throat> aid in general. I had to split that off, too many tabs. UK Defence Chief Radakin, who uh, I've referred to in a in a article this morning that I haven't produced yet, but it's going to be part of a, a kind of extra, uh, believes Ukraine will increase long range attacks inside Russia as the West's aid will help reshape the land fight. He notes challenges but points to longer trends favouring Kiev. And in the Financial Times article, uh, and now this is a chap who is or has been one of the major conduits between NATO and the West and Ukraine, and he's been frequently visiting Ukraine, actually geographically inside Ukraine, whereas American generals like Kavoli can't go into Ukraine due to the rules the US has stipulated with regards to senior military personnel not allowed in Ukraine for safety reasons. We don't have that with the UK, so Radikin has basically been your NATO guy going into Ukraine and having a lot of high-level meetings. Um, Ukraine to increase long-range strikes in Russia, says UK Defence Chief. Radikin, by contrast, expressed no apparent qualms over Ukrainian attacks and sabotage raids inside Russia. And this is directly against, uh, and we're going to hear this in a second, people like Jake Sullivan and the US. Uh, quote, as Ukraine gains more capabilities for the long-range fight, its ability to continue deep operations will increasingly become a feature of the war, Radikin said, adding, they definitely have an effect. So this is really good news, the right kind of messaging that Ukraine need, which is the UK saying, yep, go for it, you you hit those targets inside Russia. Radikin, it says at the end of the article, also pushed back at criticism that the West had no overarching glorious plan as to how to help Kiev achieve victory and had instead only given it enough military aid to forestall defeat. This is a very common criticism. Quote, don't expect anyone to say publicly this is the plan and A, B and C are now going to happen, Radikin said. Some elements of Ukraine's military approach will be hidden, some will be dictated by a tactical or operational advantage, and some also depends on more foundational aspects. Some of these factors, quote, mature much more strongly next year than this year, Radikin said, but they, quote, will enable Ukraine to shape the fighting in a much stronger ways than it has before. So some kind of cryptic hints that Distance munitions are going to play a very important part and that will increasingly be the case. That's really good news. Uh, I, as I've said many, many times, that's how Ukraine win the war. They don't do any offensive for the next six months plus, possibly even longer. And they just, that's what the plus means, I guess. Uh, they, and they, they just attack Russia with as many distance munitions and things like artillery uh, and the high Mars, the, the, those ones in the middle, so artillery and drones, high Mars, and then cruise missiles and ATACMs and their own indigenously made missiles that they're going to be creating and long distance attack drones. So Neptune missiles and then Shahid type ones or the aeroplane type ones or Liuti drones, whatever drones they do, just, just absolutely hammer the Russians consistently every single week. Uh, as much as they possibly can. They ramp up production of distance munitions because they don't lose troops and they hammer the Russians. And the Russians do lose troops and they do lose capabilities and they do lose capacity. That's what Ukraine needs to do. So, anyway, that aside, Olaf Scholz must decide whether he wants Ukraine to win the war or not, says Ben Wallace, the former UK Defence Secretary. Instead of ruling out Taurus deliveries, Scholz should cite conditions that they could justify tourist deliveries, citing Russian attacks on civilian infrastructure as an example. Better than saying, no, I'm not going to deliver them, is to say, we're constantly monitoring the situation, and if Russia continues, we'll look into it, he said. I really agree with that. I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, 
some rationale possibly behind Taurus not being given, but then give some other uh, discussion. Right, I'm going to refer you to Sophie Dorin here, who has, uh, as a Belgian commenter, great sub supporter, being a long-term viewer here, uh, has given a couple of really great comments. And I talked about one with J Jake Bro the other night, and he kind of sort of poo-pooed the idea, but I actually think I, I probably didn't do it justice enough uh, as the idea. I really think um, that there is a, a, a good case for why... Germany hasn't been providing Taurus and it and it starts something like this so regarding Taurus I've been studying up on the European and Russian nuclear situation since the beginning of this year long story short Germany better hang on to their 600 plus Tauruses why they formed an integral part of the nuclear strike force on the European continent unlike Scalp and Storm Shadow the Taurus are bunker busters Russia's nuclear weapons are protected by above ground and underground bunker complexes Taurus are designed to render their those inoperative they are the first weapons to be launched as soon as satellite surveillance sees Russia getting within an hour or two of launching its nuclear missiles, Germany has brought the whole lot to operational status a month ago. We all know Great Britain and France have got nukes, but seem to have forgotten that Germany has been concentrating on developing conventional anti-nuclear weapons for decades and have all that time had a major role in nuclear deterrent on the European continent. I'm beginning to see that the clumsy evasion and obfuscation attempts with regard to Taurus had been innate of. Uh, it is but one of the many ways NATO member states have been trying to avoid bringing up the whole hot taboo um essentially and and i really do think there is um uh, there is a good case here especially as she goes on to say more tourists may have been ordered and may be manufactured as we speak some may have been delivered to ukraine so as to get them close to the westernmost russian nuclear missile installations and in order not in order to help defend ukraine i mean the world's media will talk about a nuclear a lot in peacetime in wartime now not so uh, I just don't know. So, I mean, it, it doesn't appear that they have been ordered. But anyway, the idea is that Germany is not a nuclear state. France and the UK are. So Germany has to be a defensively minded nation with regard to what happens if we come into a nuclear war, right? They need to be prepared. So they have their best weapon is a, a bunker buster that has better bunker busting capabilities than Stor Storm Shadow or Scout, right? It's the best cruise missile they have. And they would fire it at the silos and the bunkers that contain those uh, nuclear missiles that the Russians would have and, and hit as many as they can within the range they have. And in the knowledge, so Jake Bros said, yeah, but they also fire from ships and planes and trains, etc., etc., and you wouldn't use those missiles for them. Yep, fair enough. But I think that it's not like Germany is going to be fighting on their own against a nuclear against Russia. So this is Germany's way of being of helping to mitigate against the nuclear disaster by having these missiles that that are really uh, well designed to destroy nuclear silos um and as a result they don't want these to get to russian hands so if they give Taurus to ukraine and a couple of them misfire or or russia gets hold of them in some kind of way then they can look at how the Taurus is, is made and then put countermeasures in place. And that completely invalidates the Taurus as being a missile that Germany can use in, in the event of a nuclear war. In other words, Germany are then rendered impotent against the Russians in a nuclear war. And they'd have to rely on everyone else. This is Germany's kind of one thing that they can do really serious thing that they can do to mitigate that against that russian attack so she then says thank you for mentioning my homework on taurus taurus is not only a bunker buster which scalp and storm shadow are not but its evasive maneuvering capability means it uh, seems to be its greatest strength in other words if storm shadow can do an evasive waltz taurus can do the capoeira of course, it can't be deployed against Russian ship-borne and sub-borne nuclear launch platforms, but those are in the hands of the Russian military, whereas the static emplacements are being controlled by the FSB. The Russian military has a history of reluctance with regard to using nukes, whereas the FSB, uh, formerly KGB, has a history of, on the contrary. In other words, a path leading to, from Putin's order to launch to the battery commander's launch button is the shortest inside the FSB-controlled networks. That's an interesting point. Um, during World War II, the VW, V2 rocket were controlled entirely by the SS and for the SS, unlike the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe. A simple uh, Führerbefehl was enough, by the way, getting wholesale carnage started. Um, 
so on and so forth. And she talks about the difference between the storm shadow and the uh, the Taurus there. So t she says later again, Taurus isn't there to prevent Berlin from getting nuked. The French and British nuclear arsenal aren't there to prevent Paris and London from getting nuked either. Paris, London, Berlin, Brussels, Antwerp, New York, Washington, DC. All these cities are getting nuked unless, of course, a nuclear deterrent works as intended and deters absolutely everyone from ever using them. Taurus is, however, there to prevent American ICBM into the continental ballistic missile launch platforms from getting nuked. In other words, they are there as a conventional first strike capability in order to preserve NATO's second strike capability in case of a nuclear war. And the entire uh, entirety of said capability is located in North America. Jake Bro is committing a fallacy of false re reciprocity. Taurus isn't being held back by Germany in order to protect Germany, but by NATO in order to protect specific NATO assets wherever uh, on NATO territory these assets may be located. As soon as America has left NATO, I'm sure Taurus will be assigned a new role. I think this is really good. I, I am convinced by this. And it's interesting that I don't think the US have ever called on uh, Germany to provide Taurus. I think this has come from other nations. And I, I, uh, of course, the US hasn't provided their own cruise missile. So it'd be rather weird if they did say that to Germany. But I guess the, the best argument against this might come from, well, surely someone like Ben Wallace would know the re the rationale why Taurus aren't being provided by Germany. Like, surely our own forces would know that. But anyway, I think this is genuinely interesting thinking. And the whole thing about Taurus, right, Olaf Scholz, it, in his position, isn't going to be making decisions that are based on nothing. Like his head isn't full of like three ferrets and a badger having a fight, right? He's got a brain in there and he's making rational decisions. Now it could be garbage in, garbage out. And he could, he's got his own biases and, and whatnot, but it's going to be some somewhat, it's going to be rational. So what is the calculation he's making? The problem is he's not been very clear and he's said contradictory things, which means there's probably something else going on. But then the argument against that is that, well, surely the rest of his government should know that. And surely the opposition leaders might know know that there, there must be some sense that, that those in the know will also be on on that level. So why is it only Olaf Schultz that is being reticent to give these and not other people? Now, even Boris Pistorius, I think, has, has made movements towards Taurus. So I, I don't know. But I... I for me, it's like, what's the most plausible explanation? This is plausible. It makes sense. It's coherent. Uh, I've got a lot of time for it. It might not be correct, though. It definitely might not be correct. Um, and there could be other other um, things to throw into the calculation. Let me know what you guys think. Right, so that's the whole Olaf Schultz Taurus. Uh, the UK rightly thinks Ukraine shouldn't be limited in striking deep into Russian territory with Western weapons. If Biden would finally fire Jake Sullivan, the gloves could probably come off. So Ukraine is set to increase long range attacks inside Russia as an influx of Western military aid comes to help Kiev, uh, to help Kiev shape the war in much stronger ways. And again, that's referring back to Radikin. So there's lots of people talking about these distant strikes. Now, in that context, US has authorised Ukraine to strike Crimea with long-range missiles. This is uh, actually quite disappointing because, of course, they have because they've already shot those missiles into Crimea. So, anyway, the United States has authorised the armed forces of Ukraine to hit facilities in Crimea with long-range attack and missiles that were recently transferred to Kyiv, senior Pentagon officials have told the New York Times. The goal of the ATACM strikes would be to put more pressure on Crimea, the Pentagon official said. In addition, ATACMs can be used to strike behind Russian lines in other occupied regions of Ukraine. Crimea bridge, get ready. Well, I don't think so. I don't think it's the right missile for that. So this is the opportunity that Ukraine, that, that the US have had to say, yep, you can use ATACMs into Russia. And it, they've not. They've said you can use it into Ukraine, which we were into Crimea, which we already knew, knew they could because they had done it so far with those missiles. Jake Sullivan fairly explicitly yesterday saying that they won't allow missiles to get, be shot into Russian territory itself. And that's just really upsetting. Now, this is not good news here. Ever present reminder that MCO GPS and GBU 3053B Stormbreaker small diameter bomb twos cannot come soon enough. So John Ridges is saying we need a new type of bomb because these don't appear to be doing the job. What is this? Well, 
Speaking to the CSIS, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Leplant, indicates that the Boeing Saab produced ground launch small diameter bombs. These are the bombs that have been ad adapted with guide kits and, and GPS and whatnot uh, and um, fitted into Gimlers or HIMARS, can be shot off to 150 kilometers and do similarly to what a HIMARS rocket could do. Uh, and they're a lot cheaper. However, they're not very good, uh, by all accounts. So the um, this bomb has been proven largely ineffective in Ukraine. He cites numerous issues, including ineffective TTPs, not sure what that is, and Russian GPS denials. So they appear to be getting blocked, a bit like we were hearing with the JDAMs as well. Now, whether Boeing and Saab can go back to the drawing board and, and put some additions, well, not back to the drawing board, add some additions to this, do some tinkering to get make these workable, and that'd be fantastic because there are lots of these potentially, and if, if they are completely ineffective, then that's a lot of hope and a lot of money thrown into trying to get these to a workable stage. Um, it's, a real, it's a real shame. All right, US has provided Abrams, but those Abrams, uh, bat those Abram battle tanks have been withdrawn from the front lines in Ukraine. Apparently, uh, Associated Press reports that this is in part because Russian drone warfare has made it too difficult for them to operate without detection or coming under attack. So they are too vulnerable to uh, being hit by drones, essentially, and th that has resulted in five out of thirty-one of them being taken out, um, and that, that's a real shame. I don't know how they will be used then because they're going to have to deal with drones. There's no doubt about that. Uh, AP US to help U Ukraine develop new strategies for more effective Abrams tank use amid Russian drone threat. So the US defense official revealed that Ukraine used the tanks in a limited capacity and didn't integrate taught tactics into its operations. So that's a bit of an insult, a bit of a sorry, criticism to Ukraine's way that they use these in combined arms maneuvers or possibly not in combined arms maneuvers maybe use them independently then they get hit by drones and you're like yeah but actually you need to use them with this unit and that unit and you need to have these guys that offer you protection from drones and blah 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 so i i don't know what the end result will be but hopefully we will we will see them being used effectively uh and it'd be nice to see like 10 times as many uh, as as 30 being uh used as well. Danish authorities have agreed to increase the financing of the Ukraine fund for 2024, which provides military aid to Ukraine by 590 million uh, euros. This is really good news. Denmark is just insanely good. I mean, it's basically one of the best supporters of Ukraine in the world. It is in second place, according to the Kiel Tracker. Kiel Tracker has just been updated um, yesterday to, ref I think it has slightly later date in it. So the you can see this one goes up to January. I think it goes up to February now, but it doesn't have the American aid package involved in its data um presentation there so that, that that's a real shame because obviously uh, that's only just happened so it would be unrealistic to have expected it to be considering they've been compiling this data for ages getting ready for an august the 25th release or whatever it was and then the day before that the us go and like spank a 61 billion dollar package of course then they need to work out how much of that is actually going towards military how much is going towards exactly the sort of stuff i was talking about in the in my video yesterday right a Belgian prime minister says the first F-16s are to be delivered to Ukraine by the summer. So by summer means the end of autumn, which means the end of May. Um, and that lives, leaves one month. So that is pretty impressive. Uh, USA will triple the production of artillery ammunition, 100,155 mil shells per month, according to James Mingus, whoever he is. In particular, this will be achieved thanks to the allocation of aid to Ukraine. So this goes back to, again, my video yesterday on how the aid package to Ukraine works. The aid package to Ukraine from the US is an awful lot about making the US in a better position militarily. It, what My video yesterday wasn't a criticism of the US, by the way, so I hope it wasn't taken like that. It's just like $60 billion is not $60 billion of military aid. It's at best sort of $20 billion of military aid, and the rest is other stuff. But it's also money, and, and it's not also of that military aid a lot of that money is actually going to the u.s in terms of contracts to u.s um industrial concerns 
replenishment for US stocks and improving US stocks so that you give old stuff, you get newer stuff. And, and that money is for Ukraine, but actually it's an upgraded US army. Essentially, the US aid package can be seen in part as funding for upgrading the US military. Really? Uh, and and this is an example of that. So they are now saying these arms, uh, these artillery shell producers are saying, thank you very much. With that new Ukraine funding, we can now make 100,000 shells a month. Now, of course, why do they want to make 100,000 shells a month? Because of the Ukraine war. But it also does leave the US in a better position should there be any major conflicts going forward. So if we are really concerned about this being World War Three, then is the US in a good position in the same way as I'd ask that for any other country to be able to uh, be prepared for such an eventuality. With the supplemental that just thankfully passed last night, we'll be at 100,000 rounds uh, by next summer per month. Uh, so good news for the, the US military there. And then talking about the Kiel uh, tracker, that Ukraine support tracker, as some of you know, says um, Ellie Tenenbaum, there has been some polemic about the figures of French military aid to Ukraine. So these changed significantly in the new update, and here is why. So France has always criticised, and that's partly because they do a lot of funding through the EU, and partly because they're actually quite secretive about what they give to Ukraine. Now, as I've said before, that probably only goes so far and it probably doesn't close the gap in terms of what France is doing compared to someone like Germany. After the signing of the French-Ukraine security agreement, Paris opted for a much more transparent approach, publishing a precise list of military equipment delivered to Ukraine. With this in mind, the Kiel Institute Ukraine tracker updated the figures, but there remained a big discrepancy to get the official figure of 2.6 billion euros worth of military equipment. Uh, with this in mind and the estimate of major equipment listed, the only variable rests with still undisclosed numbers of missiles delivered. While the previous ranking did not include any missile, getting to only 0.85 billion, it is hard to know how to get to 2.6 billion euros. Uh, only by posing the clearly doubtful hypothesis that we would have delivered more than 200 scalp missiles to Ukraine, do we get close to the official figure? Still, Kiel decided to go with it, considering no major tensions. France ranking really doesn't change either way. With that in mind, I still wonder about the assessment of unit costs of complex weapon systems, the open sources for scalp storm shadow ranges from uh, 850,000 euro to 2.3 million euro. Same with the SAM missile uh, Asta 30, ranging from 1.4 to 2 million per unit. And of course, they have given and they are giving a whole load of new Asta 30. These are the missiles used in the SAMP T. Uh, that's the Patriot equivalent missile system, surface to air missile system that French and Italian use. I understand France, along with others, values what it gives on the market price of what it buys to recomplete. If this is not acceptable for the old stuff, 40 year old APCs cannot be priced at the level of brand new ones. It differs for modern missiles whose unit costs may have uh, doubled in 10 years. One way or another, I think the new Kiel Tracker update gives a clearer picture of who is where in terms of Ukraine support, even if methodology can always be argued. So it's it's about making sure all the data from each country is comparable. That's not necessarily the case. It depends how you value each bit of kit that you give. Are you doing it at netbook value? Are you doing it at replacement cost? Are you doing it at the individual cost of when it was bought? There are three different ways that you can cost it. And if you're comparing each country to each other, are all of those ways being used against each other? I don't know the methodology of the Kiel Institute. Estonia has delivered two patrol boats to Ukraine in coordination with the Denmark. Can Denmark and Estonia, the two top ones? Such aid helps Ukraine secure vital sea lines and defend its waters. Um, and here we have Leipzig public transport companies donating 26 Tatra vehicles. These are trams to uh, strengthen the transport network in Dnipro. The first seven vehicles have already been loaded and are on their way to Ukraine, while the remaining vehicles will follow in the coming weeks. This is amazing stuff. Um, uh, moving on, a Swiss parliamentary committee late on Thursday voted to back a 5 billion Swiss franc, $5.5 billion aid contribution to, for Ukraine. I think this is the one I've talked about previously, and I think this is over quite a long time. So it's not like here's $5.5 billion, $5 billion, it's like here's $5.5 billion over 10 years. So here's a little bit now, and, and so on and so forth. So don't get crazy excited about this, although it is obviously helping. 
uh, as part of a broader package aimed at improving neutral Switzerland's defence capabilities. So I don't know the details of that entirely. Now, something's causing a lot of uh, discussion. Ukrainian military recruitment centres will not work abroad, said Defence Ministry spokesperson uh, Lazutkin. The Defence Ministry cannot comment on certain actions of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This, serving summonses abroad, um, looks quite unrealistic. So it's a bit of difference between what the uh, Defence Ministry wants and is saying and what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is saying because they're closing consulates to people who are um, refusing to come back for military service, something like that. And they're trying to make sure that they, you know, they want to get as many people mobilised without having to do like a full form of mobilisation. And what what they don't want to do is affect the, the economy inside Ukraine as much as possible. So all the people that work in there keep working and we're actually going to try and mobilise from people that have run away because actually that won't affect our economy. Those are other people's economies. So if we can get them back, then that's going to help. So they're doing things like closing down consular access for people who do that so they can't get passports and whatnot. So they end up being sent back to Ukraine, although Germany has said that they won't do that, and etc. etc. Anyway, Defence Ministry spokesman noted that men, quote, do not have to go to Ukraine to update their military records. They will be able to do so at consular offices and through an electronic cabinet. Lazutkin suggests that the electronic office of a person liable for military service may be launched in June 2024. So that's all um, happening. Lithuania can help Ukraine in returning men of military aid, they have said, but there is no specific mechanism yet. This was stated by Lithuanian Defence Minister Larinas Kajunas, Delphi reports, but to restrict persons in social benefits, work permits, documents, these are options that I hear from the Polish side as well. So let's wait and see what option they will propose. Maybe it will be suitable for Lithuania as well. So both countries, Poland and Lithuania, are looking at options to, you, you might say, punish Ukrainians. Basically, not give Ukrainians who are supposed to be fighting in Ukraine for the Ukrainian armed forces certain welfare payments so that gives them uh, an incentive to go back to Ukraine. Of course, chances are they might just up, up shop and move to another country where they don't have those um, commitments. But but we shall see. I mean, Ukraine definitely have to try and get as many of these people back as possible. I don't think it's going to be crazy amounts of people, though. And really, they need boots on the ground. They need it now. OK, Russia media has reported that a number of Russian drones on the front lines, the number has doubled in three months. The number of drones used by Russia on the front line has at least doubled in the last three months, according to Ukrainska Pravda, reported on April the 25th, citing its military sources. I don't know that that's definitely the case, and we're going to talk about that at three o'clock today with Daniela. Um, I think it's three or maybe two. He's literally just messaged me right now saying, I'm wondering whether it's three or two. So at some point soon, you can come and listen to me and Daniela talk about the, the numbers of drones being used. Anyway, that's enough for me. You guys take care. Speak to you soon.